So welcome to this tutorial, which is going to look at at least the first stages of how to uh, uh, create a, a sort of peeling effect. And these have become very popular uh, with the kind of effect where ash is being blown off uh, an object. And in this case, we're going to make things a little bit harder for ourselves because we're going to use a deforming object. And so before we get into the tutorial proper, just a word about that object. So I've just got a box here, uh, which I've added plenty of polygons to, so we've got plenty of divisions because we'll need those later on. And then I'm using two bend modifiers here to create a sort of contrary-wise bend that just keeps on going forever. Uh, that's because I've got a sine function here, which is providing the twist. And then what I've done is created a reference copy, or rather two reference copies. And you can do that here by right-clicking on a node and then Actions, and there will be one called Create Reference Copy. You can't see that on this one. Let me, let me try doing it over here. So if I wanted to create a reference copy here, I could do that. So I've created reference copies of these two, and then... So we have exactly the same geometry coming down here. And then I'm using a peak node, uh, which is just making a little, little bit smaller. And then I've got an object out here, and I'm putting this into something which I'm calling an underlying object. So it's just being object merged in there. So in order to separate the two outputs of our box, I'm just going to lay down a null here, maybe on this one, and I'll call this fractured. Hope if I could type. And then with this selected, I'm just going to use the standard uh, tool here to shatter. So let me do that. And we can see that we get uh, some shattering here. I'm not going to go into how that works because that's uh, an entire other subject. But what we're going to do here is use these pieces as the basis for the bits that are going to peel off our object here. So a couple of things. Uh, to remark about this, one of which is that we can't just use these fractured pieces directly in our simulation because we're going to use the cloth solver. And the cloth solver is quite particular about the geometry that you feed into it. So these sort of complicated triangles here, quads and triangles that the fractures create, aren't going to work. We're going to have to use something simpler. So actually, we're just going to use this Voronoi fracture whoops, as, a, as a basis for splitting up our object. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to lay down an attribute transfer SOP. And we're going to take our, let me make this full screen, we're going to take our original unfractured uh, geometry here, and we're going to copy across, and indeed these two bend nodes are going to fit on the bottom of this. Uh, that's an example of why you must always only select one node when you connect, otherwise it connects to both. So we're going to attribute transfer from the fractured geometry to the new geometry here, and we're going to just transfer the name attribute. Now this is giving me an error. No, the error has gone away. So what we're going to do, <coughs> what it's doing here, is it's taking the original geometry, the original geometry is just made out of quads, and each of those quads is getting a primitive attribute, which is a name, and that name attribute is being created by the fracture. And if we have a look here for a second at the geometry spreadsheet for the fracture, primitives, we can see that it has names. And each different piece of that fracture geometry has a different name. So if we transfer across, we can see that we get different names for our geometry here as well. So that's created, in effect, uh, groups of polygons on our quadrangles on our object. 
uh, which we can use to be the basis of the pieces that are going to peel off. But in order to get that to work with the cloth solver, these pieces need to be separate. The notion of separation in Houdini between different polygons is quite complicated. But essentially, when uh, two polygons are connected, it means that they share a single point. Uh, a single point is the vertex of two adjoining polygons. And when that happens, when the point is shared, that is counted as a connected piece of geometry. However, when you've got two points in exactly the same position, which are forming the two corners, the two vertices of polygons which are next to each other, if they don't share the same point, but they are two different points in the same position, uh, then those two polygons will be counted as not connected. It's a complex subject. I'm not going to cover it uh, in a great deal of detail here, but we can demonstrate by laying down a primitive split node. And what this is going to do is split up the primitives according to an attribute. So in this case, I'm using the attribute name. The tolerance, which is designed for attributes which are uh, numerical, isn't going to be relevant because obviously our name uh, is just either different or, or or not different, there's no tolerance. And we can see there's something happened here quite subtly, and that's to do with the normals. Uh, but what's happened is that originally we had 2,300 points and 2,300 so polygons. Now uh, we have 2,700 points and 2,300 polygons. So a good many new points have been created, and that shows you that different bits of this geometry have now been split apart. So the splitting doesn't actually make any difference to the the ability to deform this. Uh, we can see here, I can still put my deformer down and this, this works fine. So now we can turn this into a piece of cloth. Let me go up to the cloth shelf here and I'm just going to turn it into a normal cloth object. So let me hit that and what we should see... Oh, we need to select the object. So let's do that. Hit enter and we've now got a dot import here and we've got an auto dot network here so let's dive down into the auto dot network and we can see we've got a very simple auto dot network so we've got this which is setting up the cloth and this which is solving the cloth so if we just run it let's see what happens well everything falls down because there's gravity and that you can see already let's turn this this grid off we can see already that those different bits of those different fractures that we divided the object into are, are all splitting apart and behaving like separate bits of cloth, which is what we want. However, we don't uh, really want that to happen right uh, at the beginning of our simulation, and also we probably don't want it to fall down. We probably don't want to use gravity, so let's just turn off gravity. So how do we get it to follow the original simulation? and not break up as it did there? Well, the answer is that the cloth solver, or the, the FEM solver, recognizes a point attribute uh, which tells the solver whether or not the piece of geometry it's processing should stay with the original animation uh, or the original deforming object or not. And the name of that attribute is pin to animation. So if I lay down an attribute wrangle, we can set that value uh, for all of the points on our geometry. So it's a float valued pin to animation. And we need to set it to 1. So this is going to... This is going to set up that point attribute and that should ensure... Let's go back into our autodoc network that this will follow and I think that's uh, because we need to set the reason that's not working is because actually we need to tell it which geometry it's being pinned to what is the target geometry and in this case if I just tick this it imports the default which is to just to say that it's the same as whatever geometry we imported originally.
And so we should now see that this moves in exactly the same way that the original object deforms. So how do we get the pieces progressively to, to break off? What I'd like to do is to start with the pieces at this end breaking off and then move down and, and gradually other pieces will break off. And the answer is that we need to use a SOP solver which is going to change the attributes on the objects while the simulation is running. So I need to disconnect the finite element solver, which is the thing that's solving the cloth, and I need to put down a SOP solver, and I need to put down a multi-solver, multiple solver. And the multiple solver can connect into our network, and it can then connect two more than one solver. So what this is going to do is it's going to run the finite element solver on the object first, and then it's going to run the SOP solver. Now, I've done a whole tutorial on the SOP solver, but just briefly, when you're in DOPS, uh, you have a, an object which is a DOPS object, but buried within it is some geometry. And this geometry you'll recognize is exactly the same as geometry that you would see in SOPs. And indeed, you can use SOP nodes to manipulate it. And this is what the SOP solver does. So uh, what you can do is dive down inside the SOP solver. It'll give you a number of inputs here. We're only going to use this first one. This first one is giving you the geometry that exists at the current frame. And then you can manipulate it by using SOP nodes. And then it will go back into the simulation with that new geometry. And at the next frame, you'll get it back again, and so on. So we need to do a really basic uh, thing here, which is to lay down a group node. And it doesn't matter what the name of the group is, I'll stick it, keep it at, at group 1. And instead of enabling the group by pattern, we're going to enable group by bounding box. And we can't see our bounding box because it's hidden inside here. So I'm going to hit W to turn into a wireframe. And then if we hit Enter, we should get the controls for our box. So the first thing I'm going to do actually is increase the size a little bit so it's bigger than the deforming box. Make it quite a bit bigger actually. And the second thing I'm going to do is move it to one end here. And then I'm going to Alt left click and that will set a keyframe at that point. And then I'm going to turn off the simulation and I'm going to go to the end of our simulation, the end of our frame range, which is 100 in this case, and I'm going to move it right the way across here, and then I'm going to Alt-Left-Click again, which sets another keyframe, which means that as we go through the frames, this is, this is going to move across like this. Now, the reason I turned off the simulation is because it's tricky if you, if you scrub through this timeline with the simulation set on, it'll try and simulate delays and everything. So it's a good idea to turn it off while you're setting the keyframes. So what this is going to do is it's going to group uh, all of the points which fall inside this box. And then I'm going to do an attribute wrangle. I could use an attribute create soft. I'm going to do an attribute wrangle. And I'm going to run it over the points. And I'm just going to apply it to group one. And I'm going to set pin to animation to zero. And what we should now see, if this is working, is that this will move through and then gradually the stuff will split off, and it's not falling because we've turned off gravity, but it, it, it's splitting up okay. I'm actually going to do two, uh, apply two forces to this geometry, this the, the, the cloth that we're creating here. And the first of them is going to need to have a meta ball. So let me lay down. A meta ball. Uh, I can do that here on the create shelf. Alright, there we go. 
So I need to create the metaphor. I'm going to move it across to here. And I'm going to reduce the radius in this direction. And I'm going to increase it again in that direction and then scale it up. So let's push it in a little bit. So it's just behind the surface there. That should work fine. And a meta ball can be used uh, to create a magnet force. And a magnet force can either repel things away from the meta ball or attract them. And in our case, we're going to repel them. So let's now set up that force. And we can do that uh, using a shelf tool here on the drive simulation shelf. Uh, we should see magnet force there. And it's asking me first to select the dynamic objects. So I want to make sure that I select my cloth object here, press enter. And then it's asking me to, to select the metaphor, which is this one here. And it's now created the magnet force. And I want to scale the force in a negative direction because I want the force to blow the pieces apart. And what this should uh, do now is, uh, unfortunately, we get this, this sort of display here, which is going to confuse things. And you, on this version of Houdini, it doesn't seem to allow it to be turned off. But we can, uh, actually, we can perhaps turn it off here. Oh, well, it seems to be working. Good. No, well, no, it isn't. So let's play the simulation. And what we should see is at a certain point, uh, this will start detaching. And then as the pieces detach, they will be repelled by the magnet force and forced apart. So one of the problems uh, we've got here is that this these pieces are a bit too big. Uh, so we're not seeing much of the effect. So it's always a good idea at the beginning to keep your pieces quite big because the simulation runs more quickly that way. Uh, but the way to create more pieces is to go, let's rewind the simulation, is to go back to the creation of the Voronoi fracture here. And what we can do here is increase the number of points. At the moment we've got a count of 10, I'm going to whack that right up to 200, and that will probably cause it to pause for a bit while it works out. And then let's go back into our auto.network and play through that simulation. So we've now got many, many more pieces. And this should mean that it splits into many more. Yeah, we can see there are, there are lots more pieces now. And it's forcing that away from the metaphor. But it's still not that interesting because they're being forced away from the metaphor, but they're then just sort of staying where they are. So we need to introduce another force. And what I'm going to do, in fact, is fade out the metaphor force over a period. So I think between frame one and, and frame 50 or so, I'm going to decline the metaphor force down to zero. So again, let's turn off the simulation. Let's go to frame 50. Let's edit the, mag the magnet force, rather, not the metaphor force. And I'm going to set this. That let's go to frame 1 to start with, of course. And Alt, left click to set a keyframe. Go to frame 50. And set this to 0. And Alt, left click. And now, at any intermediate point, the force will be between those two values. The next thing I'm going to do is introduce another force, which is a fan force. So control click on the fan force in the shelf. Uh, select the objects that are going to be affected, which is the only object that's in the scene. And we can see uh, not very well, but in the center here there is a fan. Let me just. Uh, move that so that we can see it. Move it out there. Right. 
and we need to make the fan Ah, the reason is I've still got the simulation delay disabled, that's why we're not seeing it properly. So this is the fan. Let me move it back a little bit. And let me start at frame one, turn off the simulation again, with a value of zero. And then at frame, say, frame 40, let me have a value of zero again and then frame 55 let me have a value of 1 e 006 now you do need a very high force per unit area with this fan force otherwise it just doesn't move anything so let's see what that looks like so uh, it isn't working because we've got the simulation turned off. Let's see what that looks like. So, as before, for the first few frames, everything is just following the animation. Then it's being affected by the metaball force, and that's moving these things out, like so. And then it's going to get start getting affected by the fan force right now so this is going to fan everything back out of the picture and it looks very much like what we had before and that's because actually i've made a, a usual mistake a, a very common mistake in dealing with dots and that is that i've animated some parameters here both on the magnet force and on the fan force and I've got this parameter set to use default and the default is uh, that it's going to be set initially so this is not being updated at every frame it's just being updated at the beginning so I need to make sure this is set to set always and also for the fan force uh, this needs to be set always and that will make sure that the fan and magnet forces change as they should. So let's have another look at this. And the fan force we can actually watch here as it increases, I think. So that's the magnet force is doing that. And then gradually the fan force, there we are. Now we can see the fan force blowing all of that uh, stuff away like so. However, that's not terribly realistic because, of course, uh, we, we're thinking of this, this, this cloth uh, or this ash as being something that's surrounding another object. Uh, so we need to bring in that other object and enable collisions between that object and our cloth. And that is going to slow down the simulation, which is why I've left it out until now. And as you remember, we created a second object, which is just a little bit smaller than the first and will be perfect for our static object. So on the cloth tab, go select our object and go deforming collider. And that, I think, has now worked. So if we have a look in here, press L to lay everything out, we can see that we've got a whole new network here, which is taking our underlying object and solving it using a static solver and then connecting it in so it collides with everything. And notice that it's got use deforming geometry enabled, which means it's going to capture the fact that this geometry is moving around. And in fact, to speed things up, I've cached out the first few frames now of this simulation. So we can watch it pretty much in real time. And as you can see, it expands out and then blows away as we would want. One of the problems uh, with this technique uh, is that uh, these pieces are all made up of quadrilaterals. And that's necessary in order for the cloth solver to work, or at least it, they need to be triangles or quadrilaterals. 
and one of the things we can do to just make it a little bit more interesting is convert these all to triangles and that will also slow down the simulation which is why I haven't done it until now and we can do that uh, right at the beginning of, of all of this by changing the nature of our fractured geometry uh, by adding a subdivide node in here and the subdivide node will allow us to create more geometry. Let me just turn off the display of other objects for a second and go in here and we can see that it's created more quadrilaterals but we want triangles and we can do that in fact by using the loop subdivision method and that will create an object like this. If you want to have sharp corners you can just override the crease weight here and sharpen up those corners for this simulation it doesn't actually matter so I'm going to leave those like so and this is going to make it a little bit more interesting because the splits between the different pieces can now run along these triangular edges uh, as well as along uh, the, the square edges. So if we go down to the DOP import and let's play this through. So as I say it's going to make it slower because we're feeding much heavier geometry into the cross solver uh, but it is going to mean that we can create those individual pieces with a bit more detail because the splits will be more jagged between one and the next and there we are we're beginning to see that now and those pieces are splitting off and we can see it's simulating them they're being blown out by the magnet force and they're a little, little bit more jagged around the edge now there is uh, in fact something else uh, that we can probably do in shading uh, to help with this uh, but for the moment um, this is as far as we can get in making the edges look more realistic So one of the things it's always good to do in uh, a, a simulation when you've got it to a point that you think is good uh, is to put down a file cache node uh, because that allows you to cache out the simulated object and you don't have to rerun the simulation every time. Of course, if you change some of the parameters, you will have to rerun it. So let's call this um, hash cache and then we can save it to disk uh, but I won't uh, keep the video running while that's all saving out I'll stop the video so that's uh, now cached out and we can see here as we play through it all flies off like so this piece here is looks like it's getting stuck so we'll need to think about doing something about that in a minute I guess it's getting out of the range of the fan force in any case uh, I did change a couple of things before producing this final cache and they're both here in the auto.network the first thing I did was here on the cloth I changed the overall stiffness down from the default of 2000 down to 500 and the second thing I did was change the animation on the fan force so that now it uh, starts building up from the first frame not from uh, frame 40 or whatever it was before and builds up uh, to frame 50 and that's the result you get so i think we'll we'll probably leave uh, the tutorial here for the moment and come back to it uh, in a second tutorial to look at some of the other things we can do to make this a more interesting simulation uh, and those include adding some particle effects, further splitting up this, uh, the, these pieces of ash, and uh, using shading to obscure the fact that these are just triangular pieces. Anyway, I hope that introduction to the ash effect has been useful.